All right. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Faith, Family, and Friends. Pastor Ralph with you. A cup of coffee this time of day, or night, 7 o'clock. It will not bother me. Roseanne <laughs> uh, Loker is with me on my left, probably your right. I don't know how that goes. She's a great friend. She and her husband, Rod, have become good friends, actually, in the last few days and uh, months and weeks. Uh, we've been looking forward to this broadcast for quite some time. Rose has written a book where she really uh, bears her soul. Um, when I promoted our interview for tonight, Rose, and I hope you, you, um, you understood how I put it, it's a memoir-like book, really is. Uh, I'm sure it'd be a lot thicker if you wrote about all your life, as many of our books would be. <laughs> did that. But Rose uh, has written a book. It's called Rose of Grace. Um, I have to ask you before I forget, is this a picture of you when you were young? It's not. It's how Jesus sees every one of us in innocence. I love that. It's a cute girl. Um, Thank you. I want to ask <laughs> so you, too. somebody you know, family member, whatever. But uh, I like I like how you said that. And then the subtitle is My Ever After Story Out from the Cinders of Sexual Abuse. Um, just an amazing thing to be able to do that. Uh, and we'll talk later about how cathartic or therapeutic that this process of putting your story and that piece of your story, that very difficult part of your past, um, out there for the world to read. But just a couple of things, and you want to give too much away, except that we are going to give a book away tonight. Uh, Rose is. Um, my wife is watching the live Facebook broadcast, the first person to comment um, on our interview and our chat and our conversation tonight. Rose is going to give you a free copy of her book. But on the back, it says, what do you do when the reality you've always known lays in shambles at your feet? The foundation you built your life upon is just shifting, just shifting sand instead of rock solid. That's where I found myself at 57 years old in bondage to the trauma of childhood sexual abuse. And I did the only thing I knew to do, trust the Lord Jesus Christ to walk with me through the death of all I thought was true to life and freedom. Rose of Grace, the book, is not only my story, but also my process of how God brought me from an emotionally broken hearted little girl to an emotionally healthy woman. And uh, folks, if, if you're just uh, tuning in and maybe your story is, is somewhat like Rose, maybe you've experienced some sexual abuse uh, or emotional, uh, physical abuse in your life, be uh, you a woman or a man, it, it does seem like women uh, bear the brunt of those kind of experiences, unfortunately. Uh, uh, or you know somebody who has, you'll want to uh, listen to Rose's story tonight. And it's really interesting, Rose, I didn't share this with you tonight when you're at your house for dinner. Um, but we are in, here at our church where we pastor, we're in the middle of a, a series on uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, uh, broken uh, pieces of the past and how we heal up from them. And uh, your interview tonight is right kind of in the middle of our series. And I'm huh. so glad to be able to offer a couple of these copies I bought the other day from you. Yes. Uh, your, where were you at? In Centerville. Um, selling the books at Yoda's Market. What a great market that is. It is. Yeah. And, and for, they were so kind. Yeah. I was going to say, for them to be able to do that and, and offer that venue. Um, but we're going to give a couple of them away Sunday and right in the middle of our series. Uh, this Sunday's installment is on anger. But I really think that so many emotions that we experience, we pushed down to hide the broken pieces of our lives, whatever they may be. In your case, it was sexual abuse. So I'm just going to have you jump in, how, how, share with our audience how long you've known the Lord and uh, when you started dealing with this abuse and, and then maybe how you decided to, to write it down. Maybe that was difficult to think about. Was just the Lord leading you, other people? Uh, I'm just going to give you the, the podium here, so to speak. All righty. Well, thank you for having me. Um, you asked me how I came to know the Lord. So um, the summer after I finished kindergarten, I was five, and uh, one of my classmates invited me to vacation Bible school, and I believe then it was held in the Methodist church at uh, in my town, and um, I went every year, hmm. and every year I gave my heart to Jesus because I didn't know any different. Right, yeah. I can relate to that. But I know what 
five, I made the decision. When I was seven, I remember um, Uncle Duane was our Bible teacher, and he talked about the shepherd and the lost sheep. Mm. And I remember um, thinking, this Jesus knows everything about me, mm. and he still wants me. Yeah. So I'm all in. And as far as I was concerned, Jesus and I were the only ones that knew the truth other than my abusers. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And we were not, my family was not a Christian family. Um, we went from church to church to church, trying to find the perfect ones because, you know, um, they're all full of hypocrites, as according to my dad. Yeah. But the problem was, we're all in them. So, you know, it's people. So, um, but it was amazing to me as I look back, God always placed us in a, in a church where it seemed like either my Sunday school teacher or somebody in my sphere of influence um, was sharing the word of God with me. And I remember even then, I did all the workbooks. I was hungry, even as a little girl, because I really didn't know much about this God. We had Bible storybooks at home. It wasn't like we were a pagan family, necessarily. We just, you know, my parents really didn't know, um, didn't know the Lord. So um, my abuse took place from the time I was an infant till I was nine. Those are the memories I have. And um, I actually had to change my belief system, um, you know, I, I started having memories at 57. I had um, symptoms, we'll say, mm -hmm. of being sexually abused, but I had no memories to substantiate it. So I wasn't, I, I, no reason to say then that I, I had been. Mm -hmm. um, just different fears, um, nightmares, um, that kind of thing, all through childhood. So, yeah, I did. <laughs> at 57, I decided, um, oh, I was mentioning my belief system. Mm -hmm. I have grown in my life with my relationship with Christ from the time I was five till, till now. Mm -hmm. And um, I was always really, really close with God. And I, you know, I use, I use this. He was my everything. I lost my parents um, in a drunk driving accident when I was. And Jesus did exactly what he promised me. He would be with me. Mm -hmm. And I remember holding him to that um, and saying, you know, you you were with Mary. You were with David. You were with Samuel. Listed all the we'll say the children or the teenagers of the Bible. And you were faithful to them. And so I expect you to be faithful to me. And he was, and he proved it. And he used that experience um, to make me the woman I am. So he, Jesus was always more than just a vaccination. Yeah. He became my survival. Yes. And so um, by the time I'm 57, um, I have put everything I ever thought and knew on the table before God. Because I was at the point where everything just like sawdust. And that's nasty. It doesn't meet any needs. And although God and I were close, there was just this emptiness that I, I wanted. Um, didn't really understand what it was. And a very, very close sister-like friend um, asked, asked me a couple of questions. Yeah. I would say something and she would say, are you sure about that? And I'd go, well, it's what we were always taught. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, okay, but could you change your mind about it? And my re response was, well, I'll have to talk to the Lord about that. And so um, that was the ball that really started, or the question that really started the ball rolling. Um, and I went to a conference with her. And um, the whole conference was about your relationship with God, becoming free. Sorry, I got to keep my dog quiet. <laughs> um, becoming free and forgiving, being, um, just seeing God for who he really is, how holy he is, 
and um, I left, you know, God had done a lot of work. I talk about it in my book. Um, there were things there I experienced in the spirit realm that I'd never, never been uh, a part of. Before. Several people actually came and told me things about myself that I didn't know how, you know, how, how do you know I'm going to be blessed? How, how do you, you know what? I don't really understand what you're saying, but, you know. We're having a little trouble with our connection, folks. God wants to be neighbor to them. But so do I need to do something here? No, so let me let me let our folks know that okay. I don't know if it's on your end or our it could be. It's been a while since it's done this, but they're putting new cable. I, I yes. think it's on your end too. Yes. Whether the connection is um what I did want to go back to to, to kind of catch up folks up if they've missed anything and to let them know that the internet connection is a little bit wonky tonight, but we're going to make it through Rose. You had said that okay. when you were about 15 years old, you lost your mom and dad in a terrible, tragic, uh, drunken car, an auto, automobile accident. That, that had to be especially traumatic. Um, yep. Let me also ask this too. And I know this happens. Your abuse, you said was like from nine months to like nine years old. Um, or infant to nine. Yeah. I think that, and, and I think that I know this happens that because it was so traumatic that you shoved it down and you didn't have memories, but you had nightmares, of course, all those years. And then just sort of, in order to cope, you, you locked it down and shoved it down. And so this friend who asked you probing questions, uh, that must have led to some conversations where you began to remember some things more specifically. Honestly, I still had no memories. Mm -hmm. um, I went to bed uh, the night after the weekend conference. Mm -hmm. And um, as I went, you know, we dealt with a lot of um, things from past. And I still, it wasn't even really necessarily on my radar. Mm -hmm. But as I went to sleep, um, I had the first flashback. Okay. Yeah. And I knew exactly where I was, how old I was, who was with me, what happened. And I just said, okay, Lord, um, then this is, this is where we're going. And he gave me a deep peace and I, and so um, that was the beginning of what I call my death valley, mm -hmm. the death to the reality that I had created to survive mm -hmm. and um, walking then into the truth. And he, God, Holy Spirit actually taught me the truth of me because I didn't know it. Yeah. And so that's why I say I had to change my belief system mm -hmm. um, because I really didn't understand how prayer was a two-way street. God talking to me, me talking to him, not audible voice, but my heart. And I, I said, you know, with the ears of my heart, with the eyes of my heart, I would hear and see things. Yeah. And so um, that, yeah, that was how it started. And we went through a three-year Death Valley. Mm. And um, yeah, it was the hardest thing I'd ever gone through, ever. Oh, yeah. Because my whole, like I said, I built my whole life on this false reality. I thought I had a normal family. My mom, I have to say right now, my parents weren't. Um, I have a lot. Of, what? Say that one again, because we lost. My, par my parents did not know that I was abused. Oh. Um, and yes, the, the Lord and I talked often about this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they didn't, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. Right. Um, as a parent and, and back then, yeah. when I was a child, that kind of just, you know, they, there was no platform for it. There was no uh, language really, you know, for it. Yeah. Um, they knew that I had behavior that was they knew there were things I was afraid of, but they had no, they had no idea why. And so, um, yeah, that, that was how, that was how we got, we got started. So um, they knew during, nothing about it. During this Death Valley experience of three years of the Lord probing your heart, drawing you near to him, healing up those wounds and that broken nest that you had never been aware of because you were stuffing it down. Yes. That the, the three ways of 
of what we do with trauma, fight, flight, or freeze. I've been talking about a fourth option in our series, follow the Lord to keep mm -hmm. that F going. But instead of, so it sounds like you, uh, is your way of fighting it, where maybe you didn't flee or freeze, but you fought it by pushing the memories down. And then the Lord began to unlock all of that through this three-year experience that transformed your life and your identity in him. What verses in the Bible were particularly meaningful to you that really helped heal you? Can you think of any that were especially powerful and meaningful? A lot of scripture, a lot of scripture in the book. Um, so the fact that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Because when I first started um, with memories, I worked with a mentor and we would pray together and um she you know you hear the voice of the lord and i'm working really you know and so i had to claim by faith that um john i think it's john 10 um my she voice yep no problem there hold on everybody. hear my voice they follow Okay. Um, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Okay. And so that that was the pattern then. Mm -hmm. I would go to him and ask him, what do you have for me today? Mm -hmm. And then he would, um, whether he used a song, whether he used, a, you know, just something silly or some red, but okay, so do you, what would you like to say about that? And then we would... And when I say again, I'm not talking about hearing an audible voice. Right. So I'm talking about God, the Holy Spirit, using the word of God. So I would say that one about the shepherd was a huge one. Sure. Um, take me, he would take, okay, let's just say the devil calls us the selfie, the toxic self-talk we have. Yes. Those yes. are from the devil yes. and he gives us nasty names mm -hmm. he gives we're, ne we're never good enough right. we're ugly we're dumb we're stew i mean you name it all the ugly nasty names mm -hmm. and then um so god would would take me to a scripture that would show me who he says i am yeah. awesome. and so i started keeping a, well i journaled the whole time but i started keeping a record of the names that god gave me mm -hmm. so this is what the devil called me and this is what who Jesus says I am. And so there were days when I needed to go back and say, okay, who does he say I am again? I'd go back. Yes. Yeah. So there were a lot of um a lot of verses. Um and that was part of the blessing of not going through memories till I was older because I've studied the Bible for over 50 years. Sure. So I should have a good grasp of the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what he used because I would argue with him. Mm -hmm. um, that can't be true. Mm -hmm. And then he'd take me back to the word. Well, this is what the word says. Yep, that's right. That's what the word says. So I had to take sides with him against me, that's you good. know, that's to get to freedom. It, that's a great way to say it. Say that again. You had to take side I, against you that's powerful well against my flesh yeah i, I get you i knew that yeah, yeah um because mm. let's face it all i had ever known were the lies they were comfortable right. we you know, as tragic and as twisted as it is mankind likes we we like to be comfortable and if this is all we know you're telling me i'm what mm -hmm. it's it's hard to walk into that um yeah, it really is. That's a good point. If I could just hone in on it for just a minute. Um, this is a good two-way conversation. I love what you're saying. And, and besides you sharing a story, you've really given some good teaching here. But but we're so comfortable with who we've become that we don't even know the mire that we're sitting in as a believer. Yes. So in order to come out of that, it becomes uh, such an effort. And we're just happy like being a pig in a pigsty. Yes. So much effort to come out of it that we... We can't see that again. There's a pearl of great price. Yes, it's doing that feel, which I think you talk about that first yes. chapter or two. So that's very powerful, and maybe that's why the church is so lackadaisical and and lukewarm, is that we're too comfortable in that realm and we don't want to bother. And yet we've got this amazing life that we could be living 
Yes. Just living yes. Here. Yeah. Like, you see, that's the whole premise. That's the whole purpose of the book. Yeah. I knew God mm. for over 50 years. I knew God yeah. and we had a close relationship. I obeyed him. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I started to learn the truth, actually, I I went from relationship into religion, performing to make him happy with me. Yeah. So I was a good girl. That's one of the lies that the enemy told me. Mm. You're a good girl. And God said, yeah, he's using that as a as a nasty name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then he, you know, you're not a good girl. Those are chains that are hanging me down because nobody could know. I had to be so good that nobody would ever guess. And if you talk to most people that knew me at through my teen years, especially mm -hmm. there wasn't anybody that good, you know, and I don't say that to brag. It was such a heavy yoke around my neck, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't realize why, what the drive was. So I did all these good things. You know, I, I, I minister at the jail at times and I tell the ladies, you know, my good girl was my drug. It was my pain. It, that's what I use for pain management. Mm -hmm. I didn't do the sex, the, the drugs, the alcohol. No, I did good girl. And I did it really well yeah, because so nobody happy. ever guessed, mm -hmm. you That's know, exciting. so, but it's a chain around my neck. Yeah, sure. And so he breaks it. One of the, going back to scripture, this is what keeps coming to my mind. Um, the devil, the devilish name that I took on was um, an impure woman um a harlot a whore um and one day i'm reading psalm 45 psalm 4 is a beautiful psalm about that depicts jesus christ as a bridegroom and how he sees his bride and there's a whole chapter in my book on this and the name that he gave me from that nasty name god gave me the name pure Mm -hmm. And Psalm 45 talks about how he sees me mm -hmm. and he sees me as pure. And so by the end of the chapter, I'm, I'm letting the reader see this is exact. I paint a picture and this is exactly what it feels like to put on, on the name pure. Mm -hmm. You can't get over it. When we realize, even as believers, you're talking about a lax, you know, a, a real, real complacent church. Mm -hmm. It's because we forget that. My sin put Jesus Christ on the cross. Right. It's not that person that looks like they're really bad. Mm -hmm. Every, all sin put Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. And when I recognize what he died for, mm -hmm. when I was walking through sexual abuse memories, I literally would point at him, imagining him and call him a liar. This is not the truth. Um, another issue, and I know I'm jumping around a bit, but another issue was my hair. Mm -hmm. I always said I was a short hair person. I was, then I find out the truth. I'm a short hair person because my long hair was used against me. Well, by that point, I thought, oh, no, 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 we're not doing this because I am committed to being a free woman in Jesus Christ. So I'll not have short hair just because I'm afraid of long hair. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but the word of God says that a woman's hair is her glory. And I'm going, absolutely not. It's a man's snare. It is not my glory. You're lying to me. So God only had a lot of challenging back and forth, um, but he's big enough to take it. Yes, he, is. He, he, yeah. he welcomes it because he understands that this is our way to be free. Yeah. Wow. Jesus Christ gave everything he had. He couldn't have given any more than a perfect life mm -hmm. in payment for my sin. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think that he ought to get everything he paid for? Yeah, exactly. It's yes, yes. He deserves my thank you being yeah. outlived through a holy life. Not a good girl life, right? but a relationship with him in a holy lifestyle because I love him. I never want to get over the gratefulness I have in my heart for what it is to be an overcomer. Mm -hmm. Wow. So and so Psalm 45 depicted the picture of purity for me. Mm -hmm. um, hence the, the cover of the book. Mm -hmm. That little girl with innocence. Yeah. Um, no, it's not me, but that's how Jesus sees every one of us. 
And as soon as I saw that, I went, yes, Lord, that's, that is it. That's the picture. So to get out of complacency as a body of, of believers, we have got to see that we are sinners and what he went through to give us our freedom. And in that process, as you did, I think of Jacob wrestling with God. I mean, Jacob really didn't know who he was. Prince, a prince of many, and and yes, that name Israel until he had it out with God. You had it out with God. There Mm -hmm. are so many that are in the church that they're just playing the game, going to the service, but they haven't had it out with God. I'm not here to say they're not saved or anything like that. I mean, I was doing a lot the same kind of thing, I didn't have the same experience you had, but you Mm -hmm. know, I, I went to Sunday school, I was only five, or maybe it was eight. And I made that same commitment time every week just to make sure. Or on TV, you'd see Billy Graham. You, you'd feel like you were going uh, forward with when mm-hmm. George Cliche led them in the hymn, Just As I Am. And just and every time I felt it, it felt it was so new and beautiful. But I didn't really have that relationship till I had that moment of wrestling with God outside on a cliff in the woods and opening the word of God and having it speak to me. For me, it was Isaiah 41, 43, 45. But I, in those scriptures, like with yours in um, Psalm 45, mm-hmm. it was like, this is who I am? I didn't yes. know this. No, you don't yes. hear about Isaiah or, uh, or even Psalm 45 in a Sunday school class. Right. Uh, and I think the Lord really wants to strip us of those false ideas. Of, yes. Of we think we are who the church even is saying we are. And all that false humility. You know, I grew up hearing people say, well, you can't say that you're a saint. You're you're always going to be a sinner. You're dirty, no good, rotten. Even after getting saved, I'm like, yes. does the Bible really say that? No. <laughs> it calls us a sinner. It calls us saint all the time, yes. every single time. And I think we really need to get a good enlightenment about that. And, and it's not a new teaching. It's right there in the Word. No, again. absolutely. Um, absolutely. It's exciting to hear your own story about that. And as people, um, your hope in, in having written this, um is that people even if maybe they didn't have the same experience that you did absolutely whatever trauma whatever hurt or pain yes they see how that you dealt with it with the lord then maybe they can have a similar experience i've learned that trauma is Mm -hmm. all trauma is wounding there's Mm -hmm. big t trauma the you know we know what those are and there's little t trauma but it's all wounding and you know, Satan has no new tricks. Mm. It's the same wounds use different uses different ways to wound people. Yeah. So yes, that it, the, the book is for wounded people. Yeah. Um, one thing I worked really hard. I had a I took a class on how to write, and then I um, the professor uh, became my content editor. Mm. And our goal was this is. It could be a horribly dark story, but if it's a dark story, Jesus isn't the main character. And I wanted Jesus to be the central focus. He's the reason. We can all tell stories, but Jesus is the reason why we're free. So he needs to be the main character. And so we worked really hard together Mm -hmm. to make sure that this was a book that was as light as it could be and still be honest because I, I had to be honest. My own history mm-hmm. and so i i felt i just i had to tell enough mm-hmm. so that people knew that i was not just making up a story that yeah. these things happened mm-hmm. because i want trafficked people yes i want people who who suffered much more than i did um my, my abuse happened uh like several days here or several in pockets i'll say of time it wasn't all day, every day, all night, every night. Yeah, like I want them to know that Jesus Christ is qualified, willing, and able yes. to take them from be, being a survivor to an overcomer. So I had to be honest. Mm-hmm. And so there are different tools that um, the Lord put in my mind to use to keep that storyline light. Mm-hmm. I'm very honest. I, I deal with my struggles. Mm-hmm. Um and and my uh talking with the lord through things mm-hmm. but um it is from i had i had about 50 people read my book before it ever got to the publisher because i needed to know 
is this a book? Did I accomplish what I wanted to accomplish? Okay. And almost all of them said they would recommend it to somebody else that it definitely, um, yes, I was honest, but that was not the theme of the book. The abuse was not the theme of the book. And so I went, thank you, Lord, because that's what, I, you know, that was the goal. So, wow. You know, Ro, do you think there's hope that the body of Christ will receive that inner healing that I believe the Lord Jesus wants to give us that, well, let me just say this, and I've shared it here at church a few times, in particular during the series that we're dealing with, it's a title, Till We All Are Healed, or Till We All Are All Healed, <laughs> I, I guess is a better title, but I, I share the story how that about 20 years ago, in praying for revival for our nation with some pastors, we would do this regularly on a weekly basis back in Maine where I'm from, I remember the Lord telling me one time, I, we just did our own little thing and then we got together to pray at the end, but I was walking around a church or I, I pray a walk a lot because it keeps me awake and I, I like to be moving when I'm praying. And I remember the Lord saying, I'm not going to bring revival to my church or my people until there's an inner healing in, in their midst. You want to see soul saved. You want to see this great awakening. Like I had studied <laughs> them, you know, throughout history. Mm -hmm. I, and I, I love that the history of revivals in the world, in particular America. And it's always been a burden of mine, but God stopped me in my tracks and said, until my people get healed emotionally, uh, that's not coming. And I've always believed that to be true. So the more we can share our stories like you are yes. book form or just one-on-one -on -one with small men's groups or small women's groups. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the heartbeat of a healthy church, I believe, are small groups right. where you can let your hair down, be it long or short. <laughs> And, and just be who you are and allow other people to hear yeah. however much of that story. Because sometimes we do, as you said, we emphasize the darkness way too much. And, and we only need to share as enough that we're heard and, and people still accept and love us. Because uh, I do believe that that, as well as sharing it with God, is also a help too. Um, yes. And I hope we're coming to that. I do see good signs of it, uh, mm -hmm. not just with your story, but different people that we've had. On our show, and not long ago, I think yes. I shared with you the uh, editor um, of Guy Post magazine sharing the story of his wife who took her life publicly and how healing that was. We both were weeping in, in that interview. So, God's doing some amazing things, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's, <laughs> he's just so good. He, yeah. He's he's just so good. I, I, re, I started telling the girls at the would minister to them, you know, if the world knew the truth of who God, Jesus Christ, Abba Father, Sweet Spirit, Holy Spirit really is, if we knew who he really is, mm -hmm. we would be jumping over the top of each other to get to him, not running away from him in shame, yeah. not shaking our fist at him in anger, um, but, you know, we... But no, the enemy lies to us and he starts when we're really, really little because he wants to steal children from the kingdom of God, period. It's a battle between God and the devil to see who who's going to win. Well, we know God wins. He's already defeated. Jesus defeated him at the cross. And we are the ones who keep giving him our territory. Yeah. So, you know, the whole book is about me reclaiming the territory the woman that he created me to be. Amen. Amen. And we need to add this too, in case anybody, we sometimes might have people who, well, are, why aren't you talking about the conviction of sin and how that we, you already mentioned that. That doesn't mean that if we see who God sees, who we, who we wanted us to be, doesn't mean that, that we don't also see the boneheaded decisions and choices that we've all have made. And you, you should right. very honestly, how that you were trying to keep your own identity and, and having it out with God, there's no reason to believe that it can't be both. Amen? And, yes. And I yeah, think yeah. that a lot of us, both of us struggle with a poor self-image than we do, a vaunted, arrogant image. But even for that, it's it's those who are very insecure about themselves that have that sort of surface um, view of themselves. And God just wants to bust that and just bring them to... Right. You know, yeah. So, right. That's awesome. Yeah. Where do you minister? What jail do you minister to the women? Um, I have ministered at the Branch County Jail um, I, a couple years before COVID, and then everything shut down. 
Yeah. And then I had a short season um, in this last year where I went back and um, was able to to share my story a bit more. Um, and then uh, just this last, just this week, um, I went again and was able to, here's the book that I told you I was writing and, wow. you know, get, give the jail a copy. So I can't imagine any group of people needing to hear your story more than than those women or I mean, I've been men uh, who are incarcerated yeah. really have a poor idea of who they are. They've made so many mistakes and they're screwed up. They don't think anybody's ever going to trust them uh, again on the outside. And so they're in a position where, uh, where this is good news uh, as it should. Yes. yes. And it, you know, it was so, uh, I just knew on there um, just like I knew pretty much from the beginning that this was a story I needed to share. I, I don't know why I, I just felt compared, compelled from the very beginning. This is a story that, that I will share. Um, so to, to work with the, with the jail women, um, I was a good girl. So they could look at me and go, ah, we got nothing in common. Oh no, we have a little much in common. And as soon as I would, would share with them my wounds. Oh my gracious. The room would get still. Really? Tears would start running down faces. And the verse now that just keeps ringing through my heart, it's the one little phrase of Colossians 127. Mm -hmm. Jesus, but I may get personal. Jesus in me is the hope of glory. And it's not just my glory. And it's, it's the glory of Jesus in me so that others can also have the hope of glory. How selfish is it for me to be an overcomer and then not share it with, with others who are captive? You know, captive. Yeah. One of the sweetest things I remember in the, in the death, as I call it, is when God and I were done um, with with maybe walking through whether it was an identity or a new memory or whatever, mm -hmm. but I had finally agreed with him. And so many times it, I would see in my imagination, like I could see the chains falling to the floor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the movie, sometimes how you'll see a, a lighted, a light in a dark room and you see the dust very slowly settle. Yeah. And that is the peace that the newness that would come over my soul when I realized that I was no longer held by whatever that I false identity was. And so, you know, Jesus shared at the well in John four, a living water. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that once you've tasted living water, you don't ever want the brackish muddy water ever again. You know, nobody can make me drink that again. No, I know not life tastes like it's Jesus. I know what living water tastes like. It's his word. Yeah. And I don't want to go back. Yeah. No there was a lot of fear too. There's a lot of fear in the beginning since my, you know, my reality was false. Mm -hmm. What about all these people that have known me my whole life? Yeah. Where does that leave me? Yeah. You know, are they going to, you know, are they, and the God was just so good. He was just so good. Those close to me, you know, um, just let me know, not a problem, <laughs> you know, not a problem. No um, and I really, I will say, you know, that's, that's a, excuse me, a fear that people would wonder, okay, is it really good? How much am I going to really have to give up? Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of, addicts of all kinds you know giving up my good girl right. oh, you know what is that what is that going to cost me i want to tell you it costs you absolutely everything but what jesus gives us in return makes our everything look like dust on the table versus gold laying there you know so true so it it just isn't worth keep hanging on to it just isn't worth it he gives back when we give. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, right? Yes. God, wow. Can you uh, close our time out with maybe praying for those who might might be uh, sure. listening in? And we're listening later when we rebroadcast this and on YouTube. You just never know who might be who might be listening who who needs this uh, tonight, Rose. Thank you so much for being 
our guests. This has been awesome. Go ahead. Thank you. Amen. So, Father, I just want to thank you so much for your love for all mankind. Yes. Each individual that ever drew a breath, every child that was ever conceived, Jesus Christ gave his life. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible says, if we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, we shall be saved. You save us from hell, you save us from ourselves, and you save us to you. You are so good. So, Lord, I just pray for anyone really struggling, anyone who does not know who they are, that they would see that they would hear your call, that they would see you in, even in their imagination, Lord, drawing them, sense you're pulling them towards you because you love them so much that you want to have relationship with them. There was not a person you created that you did not want relationship with. And there is any of us have done that is so bad that you don't want us. So God, I just, I pray for them. I pray for their, them, their belief. I pray that they will receive faith. And I pray God that they would be willing to see the truth and then follow the good shepherd to freedom. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you. I want to pray for Rose tonight that this book would, uh, I know she's not looking for stupendous sales or bestseller. She has written her story, born her soul, in the pages of this book, in order that, Lord, you would use her story, this book, to be a blessing and a help to other people who are going through similar circumstances, maybe maybe not the same, but some kind of trauma, some kind of brokenness. And Lord, just uh, I pray that there would be an extra special anointing on it, that as it goes forth and it's sold and given away and whatever else, Lord, that other people would buy it and give it to other people they know who are struggling, who need you. Because, Lord, it really is all about a new transformed identity with you. And, and we thank you that you, you did that with Rose and you pressed her through the valley, death valley for three years. And you brought her out the other side, a, a, a transformed woman who knows who she is in Jesus and never wants to go back and drink from some stagnant, murky swamp when she's got the living water. Thank you, Father. We can all have that. And I pray that we want just to take a drink of it, a taste of it, but we will be immersed with it. Thank you for our fellowship together tonight. And for all those who listen, and we'll be listening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much, Rose. Let's Thank stay you. in touch. And I'll send yeah. this to you as soon as I get it up. Okay. Thank you so much. God bless. Thanks, everybody, for listening. All right. Bye.